Dasa, you, the goddess, who rains down the nectar of Advaita in 18 chapters, the destroyer of relative existence. I worship Krishna, world teacher, the son of Vasudeva, the supreme delight of Devaki, and the slayer of the demons, Kamsa and Chanur. I adore that supremely blissful Madhava, by whose grace the mute are made eloquent, and the lame are enabled to cross over mountains. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tatsat Om Peace, Peace, Peace be unto us all. So greetings to everyone. And we will begin today where I left off uh, last time. Uh, that is, we are to start on verse 16 of chapter 2. <clears throat> and let me just mention it, not that it's important, but just uh, uh, because some people would want to know uh, that I'm changing the editions of the Gita that I'm working from. <clears throat> it doesn't matter what edition you have, because I will translate each verse and then the only difference it will make is that I read an English translation after I have translated and discussed the verse. Uh, and so now I'm going to be reading from Swami Vireshwarananda's uh, Gita uh, and Sridhara's commentary. I have been using Madhusudana's uh, commentary by Swami Gambhirananda, and I will continue to use that for interpreting the Gita, basically. Uh, uh, but because Swami Vireshwarananda's English translation is much simpler. The English is much simpler and more straightforward. I'm going to use that from now on. Uh, but again, whatever you use, if you want to follow along in the text, it doesn't matter. The only qualification I would make on that is that the Krishna Consciousness Gita that's uh, known as uh, the Bhagavad Gita as it is, translated and commented upon by uh, Prabhupada, uh, uh, that the interpretation will be very different from what we give. I give the basic uh, 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 Vedanta tradition of, of the Shankaracharya's interpretation of the Gita with the modern light thrown on it by Sri Ramakrishna and Swami Vivekananda. Uh, uh, but the Gaudiya Vaishnava school of interpretation of the Gita is very uh, different because they consider the supreme reality as the form of Sri Krishna itself, uh, the rupa, the murti of Sri Krishna. They don't accept the idea of the uh, nirguna Brahman, but that clearly is part of the Gita itself. And so um, uh, uh, that the, there's nothing, I have nothing against that uh, school of uh, Vedanta or that translation, except that it will be quite different from the way we interpret it. So, uh, to bring us up to where we are now, verse 16, just very briefly, uh, you know the story of how Sri Krishna, uh, Sri uh, Arjuna has seen the opposing army, seen his uncles and cousins and his gurus uh, that he's to fight with, and he falls apart. Uh, he says that he can't fight because it would be the des destruction of society. It would be cutting the very fabric of society to fight with these people, so he refuses to fight. And then Sri Krishna in the second and third verses of chapter two uh, tells uh, Arjuna that he is acting in an unmanly uh, fashion. That is an Arya Jushtam. It's uh, not worthy of an Arya, of a noble person like him. And so he must stand up and do his duty. That his, his whole life has prepared him for this battle. It's a righteous battle and he must uh, do his uh, duty. And so then again, Arjuna gives various arguments. And last time we began on verse 11, uh, which is where Shankaracharya begins his tradition, his commentary on the Gita. He doesn't make any commentary on the first chapter or the first 10 verses of the second chapter. He only begins on verse 11 of chapter 2, where Sri Krishna begins to teach Arjuna. Um, and as I said last time, Sri Krishna begins by teaching Arjuna the nature of the divine self. He doesn't begin with prapatti, surrender to God, or devotion to God, or how to meditate, uh, or anything else. He begins by telling him about his own divine nature, how he is the Atman, which is eternal, uh, uh, indestructible, 
Uh, and the reason for that is that Arjuna is in a critical situation. He's in a life and death situation where he has lost all of his courage, all of his uh, uh, self-composure, his mental balance is completely undone. And so Sri Krishna, being the divine being itself, knows that the only thing that will rouse Arjuna is the call to his innate divinity, call to the, uh, the, uh, the divinity which is manifesting as him. And so just as Swami Vivekananda in the modern times, he went around the world teaching about the Atman. Even when he taught devotion, which he did, he would put it on the basis of non-dualism. He would say that always remember that the hand who reaches down in answer to your prayer is your own hand. Not this hand, <laughs> the hand of the higher self, the hand of the Paramatman, which we are. And so the, uh, the, that is getting across the idea that there's no difference between you and the Supreme Self. God is not somewhere outside of you uh, uh, that is sitting somewhere ignoring you when you're in trouble and then you pray and then God says, well, I guess I better help them out. And so then comes and helps you. No, God is your own higher self. Um, and uh, in the Gita, you find that Sri Krishna goes in the... In this second chapter, he speaks mainly from the standpoint of the uh, Atman. But uh, in future chapters, especially 7 through 12, and even beyond that, 7 through 18, he uh, keeps going <clears throat> between the appeal to the Atman and Ishwara, God. Because in non-dualistic Vedanta, Advaita Vedanta, there is not the radical distinction between the uh, inner self, our own self, and the divine self. No, we are not Ishwara, but Ishwara is Brahman and we also are Brahman. Uh, and so we don't make the sun rise or make the sun set. We don't control the destiny of all beings, but we are the same infinite Brahman that Ishwara is. And so in Brahman, we are one with Ishwara. In manifestation, uh, we have small, very limited power. God has infinite power. We have a, a, a tiny bit of knowledge. God has infinite knowledge. But in reality, in Brahman, we are both one. And so that is the reason why in the Gita, Sri Krishna keeps going from appealing to the Atman to appealing to uh, Ishwara, because going back and forth is not the contradiction which it would seem to be. So we come to verse 16. <clears throat> in chapter 2, which says, Nasato vidyate bhavo na bhavo vidyate sataha ubhayora pidrishtontas tvanayos tatvadar shivihi. So this says, Nasato vidyate bhavo, that uh, uh, of the uh, non existent, asato, uh, of the non existent, bhavo uh, uh, nasti. There is no abha, there is no bhava. That is, there is no the non-existent has no existence. That which doesn't exist uh, never comes to exist. Na bhavo vidyate sataha. Nor uh, of the existent is there ever non-existence. So, in, in simpler terms, that means that that which is never ceases to be, and that which isn't never comes into being. Now, you know that uh, in uh, Christian theology, one of the basic ideas in Christian theology is ex nihilo creation, that God created the universe out of nothing. Now, Vedanta says that that's impossible. Why? Because out of nothing, you get nothing. You can't get something out of nothing. Nothing means it doesn't exist. And suddenly if something exists, where did it come from? It must have been in another form before its present manifestation. When a child comes into uh, this world, is given birth, uh, then it looks like a new creation. The child has just uh, uh, come, but no, it's not a new creation. Uh, neither the physical material, which was pre-existent, uh, forming the body and the, uh, the mind of the child, nor the Atman, the self. 
uh, those of you who have had children or those of you who don't have children but had brothers and sisters know how little children always are curious about uh, mommy where was i before i was born and my mother may say well you were in my tummy i said well where was i before that uh, they uh, they want to know uh, what their previous existence was they can't believe that they never existed nobody can believe that they never exist and that's why we have this contradictory idea that i'm never going to die in reality you are never going to die and so this idea that we ha everybody has we think that uh, we see people dying all around us as uh, yudhishthira says in the mahabharata the strangest thing in the world is we see people dying all around us but we think that we will never die well that's because we have an intuition of the eternal nature of the self we just misapply it to the body and think this is never going to die i'm never going to die means this body is never going to die but of course we know when we think about it that we will this this body will die but we won't die <clears throat> we existed before birth we existed we will exist uh, after death because nasato vidyate bhavo na bhavo vidyate sata that uh, which doesn't exist never comes into existence and that which exists never goes out of existence so why is sri krishna teaching this uh, to arjuna because arjuna is undone at the idea of killing and being killed he's undone by the idea that he has to enter into battle and fight with his kids, kinsmen and his gurus and uh, so the idea of killing them has uh, uh, made him fall apart luckily most of us never have to face that situation <laughs> and may we never have to face that situation but arjuna did so uh, the lesson of the gita is not that you can kill somebody and it doesn't matter because they're going to be eternal anyway no, the lesson of the gita is uh that we never die we never die nor does anyone die uh, and so when death comes to the body that's not the tragedy it looks like we feel sad as i think i explained last time or maybe it was in the class here i forget which uh, but uh, we feel sad because we have lost a dear one that uh, whose company we love but for the person who has passed away there's no sadness we weep to think that, oh, this young person died before they could experience high school graduation. They couldn't go to college. Uh, the beautiful wedding that uh, would have happened for them and uh, the uh, future career and all of these things. Uh, that's from our standpoint, from the soul that passes away, whether they pass away young or middle-aged or old, uh, it's like waking up from a dream. When you wake up from a dream, you don't think oh my goodness i lost to that beautiful house i had in the dream what am i going to do now i'm so sad i'm so sad no you realize that was a dream i uh, awakened and now i move on <clears throat> and so when we pass away <coughs> excuse me we wake up from this dream but unless we are illumined we wake up into another dream <laughs> we go from dream to dream so this all of this that we see disappears and something else appears a new life appears to us, a new existence, a new world uh, appears to us. Uh, but for the departed, there's nothing to grieve over. As Sri Krishna said in the 11th verse, which we took last, uh, last time, Ashochanan Vashochastvam Pragnyavadam Shabhashase. You're grieving for those who shouldn't be grieved over. The, the wise never grieve over anyone because they realize the eternity of the soul and death is just a change of form and so uh, the non-existent never comes into being the existent never goes out of being those who know the truth those who know the truth uh, they uh, 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 know, uh, uh, know this uh, truth about both about non-existence and about existence and so the running translation is the unreal has no existence and the real has no non-existence the conclusion about both these has been seen by the knowers of truth the knowers of truth have seen the conclusion uh, of both existence and non-existence what does non-existence mean 
It means that it is not. So non-existence is a word that we use to indicate something which doesn't exist at all. And so it's the strange nature of language that when we talk about uh, something, it seems to have a real. Uh, and so we can talk about non-existence. And we might say all kinds of things about non-existence, what it is not and why it is not and so forth. But the fact that it's not means that it's not. <laughs> There's nothing there called non-existence. It's not, we, we think of it as a label and everything that has a label, it goes on the thing itself. But non-existence, where do you put the label on non-existence? It means there's no such thing. <clears throat> and out of that, nothing can come. So that's why in Vedanta, uh, we say that this whole universe has come out of Brahman itself. It's come out of Brahman itself. And it is even now Brahman. Insofar as anything here has existence, this seems to exist. This body seems to exist. That existence is the existence of Brahman. The body itself is an appearance of Brahman. This table is an appearance of Brahman. This uh, text is an appearance of Brahman. Everything, uh, everything that exists, exists by virtue of Brahman itself. Brahman alone is existence. And everything else is an appearance of existence. And so uh, Vedanta doesn't say that the universe doesn't exist. Nor does it say that the universe came out of nothing. No, the universe came out of Brahman and it is an appearance of Brahman. So uh, that's where the, the, the theory of Maya and all of that comes. As Swami Vivekananda says, Maya is not a theory, nor does it, say, nor does it mean illusion. It means that we are seeing something, but we're misreading it. We're misreading it. If we had the eyes of Sri Ramakrishna, that is the spiritual eye of Sri Ramakrishna, we would see that everything is divine. Everything is Brahman. Everything is like, as he would say, it's like uh, the figures in a uh, wax museum. Everything is made out of wax, but it looks real. But when you go close, you find it's nothing but wax. And so he would see everything here as Brahman itself, just taking on name and form. So the unreal has no existence, or that is the non-existent has no uh, existence, and the existence has no non-existence. The conclusion about both these has been seen by the knowers of truth. So he continues in verse 17, the same idea. Avinashi tu tat vidhi yena sarvamidam tatam vinasham avyayasyasya nakaskit kartum arhati. So that says, avinashi tu tat vidhi, but know that that which is indestructible, but know that which is indestructible, uh, which pervades all of this, that the indestructible pervades all of this. Now again, as I said, language is a strange thing because it points to a truth where we can use it to point to a truth, but it never quite expresses the truth. And so when we say that the reality, Brahman, pervades all of this, it's not really like that. That's what we have to say because we have to use words. But if you say that Brahman pervades everything here, as Sri Krishna is saying here, again, it's the best way that you can express it. It sounds like there is all of this, and in the midst of it, there's something else called Brahman pervading it. But no, Brahman is what we're seeing. So it's not that there is something like this, which I call a hand, and that Brahman is, is uh, inside of it somehow pervading it, but there's the hand and Brahman inside of it. No, it's not like that. That Brahman is the reality of it. Brahman is the reality of it, but I'm misreading it as physical hand. And so uh, the avinashi tu tad vidhi yena sarvamidam tatam. So know that uh, which pervades all of this to be imperishable. So the reality which appears as all of this is imperishable. Avinashi. It can't be destroyed. Avinasham avyayasya nakastit kartamarati. No one can destroy the uh, indestructible. No one can destroy that which is indestructible. And reality is indestructible. Everything else is just changing of forms, changing of forms, changing of appearances. But the reality, which, as Sri Krishna says, is pervading all of this which is manifesting as this, which is appearing as all of this, 
that is never destroyed. So like the conservation of matter, the conservation of energy, uh, there is the conservation of reality. Uh, reality never changes, Re reality never disappears. Uh, there only the form changes. Like if you have a piece of clay, you can mold it into various shapes, but you still have the same clay. You can make all kinds of things out of a piece of clay, an infinite variety of forms you can mold out of it, but it's still, the clay is still there, no matter what form you give to it. So everything here is just forms given to the formless Brahman. So, but know that by which all this is pervaded to be imperishable. Avinashi to tadbiti. No one can bring about the destruction of this immutable principle. So Brahman, no one can destroy. The Atman, no one can destroy. That which is, no one can destroy, because that which is never comes to non-existence, as that which does not exist never comes into existence. Uh, as I was saying in language, well, language uh, many times fools us into thinking that uh, things are different from the way they actually are. And the same can be said in uh, mathematics. You know, the ancient uh, Greeks and Romans and Egyptians, they had no concept of zero because they understood zero to mean nothing and nothing doesn't exist. And so that which doesn't exist, uh, well, why do you even have a concept of it? It doesn't exist. And so as far as that went, they were correct. That was a good insight. But in mathematics, zero is extremely useful. Uh, and so in, in India, they discovered the concept of zero. And the Mayan Indians in uh, Central America also discovered zero. And uh, that the zero is extremely uh, uh, useful. And so you find negative numbers and irrational numbers and so many things we use which don't actually correspond to things, but which do are extremely useful in the understanding of the world of things. Uh, so that, therefore we use, uh, the, use such things uh, all of the time in mathematics and physics uh, uh, and in so, uh, engineering so many different fields. So, uh, but uh, again, the idea is that the indestructible can never be destroyed and that indestructible is what we are. Our misery comes from identifying with the things about ourselves that are always changing. Uh, but if we can learn to identify with consciousness, the light which illuminates all my experience, which is really what I am, I don't lose anything by identifying with consciousness. I gain everything. If I can identify with that, then I find that no change is a threat to me. So then we go on to verse 18, which says, Andavanta ime deha nityas yokta sharirinaha anashino prameyasya tasmat yudhaswa bharata. Here he says, Andavanta ime deha. Uh, these bodies, they uh, have uh, a uh, beginning and an end. Uh, these bodies, uh, 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 or uh, actually it's just Antavanta, uh, uh, Antavat. Uh, they have an end. These bodies uh, have an end. Your body, O oh Arjuna, the body of all of these soldiers, my body, all of these bodies have an end. They're andavanta. Nityas yokta sharirinaha. But the one dwelling in the body is nitya, is eternal. The one dwelling within the body is eternal, has no death. And so it's uh, sharirina, sharirin, the one dwelling within a sharira, within a body, uh, is eternal. Anashino aprameyasya. It's eternal. Anashino aprameyaswa. It's immeasurable. It can't be measured. So this which dwells within the body, that which you are, that which I am, that is uh, indestructible. It's immeasurable. Tasmad yudhyasva bharata. Therefore fight, O Arjuna. Therefore fight. So again, remember that uh, the context that uh, Sri Krishna sees that Arjuna has come undone because he's afraid of the battle with his, he's not afraid, uh, so, uh, not afraid of death for himself because he's a great heroic warrior. He's been trained as a great heroic warrior. So it's not that he's a coward. 
Uh, the problem is that he's afraid of killing others and therefore being the cause of the destruction of society and the misery that will come to him knowing that he has killed his own kinsmen and his, his own respected teachers. And uh, so uh, Sri Krishna is uh, uh, telling him that no, that which dwells within the body of each one of us, that which we are, that is Anashi. Uh, and uh, uh, that, uh, 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 and it is nitya. It's uh, vina, uh, avinashi. It's without destruction, and it's nitya. That is, it's eternal. So the running translation is: these bodies of the eternal, imperishable, immeasurable, embodied self are said to have an end. So the the uh, the imperishable, the self within the body is imperishable, but the bodies have an end. Uh, <clears throat> therefore, fight, O descendant of Bharata. <coughs> Excuse me. So here you'll find this refa refrain coming again and again, especially in the early chapters of the Gita, where he'll give Arjuna a teaching, and then suddenly in the midst of the teaching, he'll say, therefore, tasmad uh, utishta Bharata, therefore stand up, O Bharata. Or tasmad yudhyasva bharata. Therefore, uh, fight, O bharata. Uh, so again, he's telling him the highest truth. But also, there's an immediate situation that Arjuna has to face. And so he's saying that this is the eternal truth, no matter what your situation. But knowing this, now you're in this situation where you have to fight. So stand up and fight. And so that, as I've uh, said in other classes, we have to always remember that Sri Krishna is teaching the Gita to us, <clears throat> that we are Arjuna. And so we're not on a physical battlefield, <coughs> and yet we are in the battlefield of life, the uh, Kurukshetra of our own life. Our own life is Kurukshetra, which is Dharmakshetra, the field of Dharma, where we exercise ourselves in the practice of Dharma. And so uh, uh, we, uh, uh, we're fighting on the battlefield of life where every moment we're having to make decisions, whether to do this, whether to do that. Most of our decisions are not uh, life and death decisions, luckily. Most of our decisions are very mundane, whether to go to this grocery store or that grocery store, uh, whether to buy broccoli or cauliflower. Uh, whether to uh, uh, get up at this time or sleep in for another half an hour because I didn't sleep so well at night. Uh, but the fact is that every day, every moment we're having to make decisions. And so Arjuna was making life and death decisions or about to make them uh, when the battle would begin. Uh, but we make decisions every moment also. And so we have to take this uh, teaching and then lead our lives. <clears throat> so for us also this instruction is there, tasmad yudhyasva bharata. Therefore, knowing this, then face your life boldly, face your life bravely, and go forward knowing uh, this truth that Sri Krishna is teaching to us. That's why Swami Vivekananda said that uh, late in his life, in his second trip to the West, he said, uh, more and more it's the heroism of the worm that I admire who goes about its daily duties uh, without any fanfare, without any praise or anything, just carrying on its uh, daily life uh, heroically. And he would say, he also said at that same time publicly, he said that, is there any one of you who is not carrying their cross, like the cross uh, that Christ uh, carried uh, to uh, Golgotha for his crucifixion? So is there any one of you who is not carrying their own little cross, uh, Jesus carried a cross for the whole world, but we have to carry the cross of our own individual lives. All of us, every day, face so many problems. And we have to face them, we have to make decisions. Many times, even in our lives, we have to make decisions that we don't want to make. Decisions which are hard to make. Decisions where we don't know what the outcome is going to be, and so we don't really want to have to make it, because we are afraid we might choose wrongly. But we have to stand up and go forward with life, with the best uh, information and the best <clears throat> light that we have, no matter how weak it might be, we have to go forward. And so for us, this is also meant, tasmad yudhyasva bharata, therefore stand up and fight. 
So uh, then uh, verse 19, he says, Yainam vetti hantaram yaschainam manyate hatam ubhautau navijanito nayam hantina hanyate. So uh, this is a verse which is uh, shared with minor change with the Kata Upanishad. Several verses in the Gita and the Kata Upanishad are common. And this is one of them. So Yainam Vetti Hantaram, one who thinks uh, that this, the, the, the self, you, when he says this, Enam, this, he means you, you are the self. And so one who thinks uh, that uh, this self is the killer, hantara, yaschainam manyate hatam, or one who thinks that this is killed, meaning that which I am. When I say I, right now I think of Swami Atmarupananda, the body-mind complex, born at such and such a place on such and such a date and so many years old uh, with uh, this personal history. No, 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 that's all ignorance. Eventually, I, when I say I, then the idea of the Atman should come. Uh, and so uh, this, again, language is calling it this, but this, this, this is I, that which I am. So this, one who thinks this to be the killer, or one who thinks this to be the killed, uh, neither one knows the truth, neither of these knows the truth. This neither kills nor is it killed. So you, if you were in battle, you would neither kill nor be killed, no matter how much action you were involved in. Uh, because the self is, uh, neither, can neither kill nor be killed, because the self is eternal, and the self never changes. The body engages in action, but the self is the silent witness. Our problem is that we identify the uh, self with the body and mind and the ego, which takes responsibility for, for action. The kartaham, I am the doer. Kartaham miti manyate, the, I, uh, one thinks I am the doer. Bhoktaham, I am the enjoyer. I am the experiencer, I am the doer. But no, I am the light which illuminates the doing, but I'm not the doing itself. As a lamp uh, illuminates a room, and people do all kinds of things in the room, good things and bad things in the room, but the light illuminates both. The light has nothing to do with that which is done in the room. It's not the light's fault that someone forges a check in the room, nor is it the light's uh, praise that someone writes a check to charity in the, uh, in the room. Uh, the light is just that which illuminates, which makes known that which has happened. And so we are that light which makes known everything. And because we are that light which makes everything known, we are the light in which everything happens. But we are not affected by that happening if we can realize that that's who we are. We find ourselves affected because I identify with the body and mind and say that I am the doer. Kartaham, I am the doer. So he who thinks uh, the self is a slayer and he who thinks the self is slain, both are ignorant of the truth. The self neither slays nor is it slain. And then uh, verse uh, 20 says, Najayate mriyate va kadachin nayam putwa bhavitava nabhuya ajo nitya shashvato yam purano nahanyate hanyamane sharire. So this continues the same thought that Najayate mriyate va kadachin. This never uh, born, uh, is born nor does it ever die. Nayam putwa bhavitava nabhuya uh, nor is it. Uh, that uh, having uh, once come into ex uh, existence, uh, that it uh, uh, that it uh, uh, that it does, uh, that it will not come into existence again. So nayam bhutva, nor this having come into existence, uh, will it not be again? So that is that once uh, you know, we exist now, but the fear is I'm going to die and I won't exist. No, that doesn't happen. Uh, I uh, exist uh, uh, forever. Ajo nitya shashvato yam purano. This is unborn. We think that we were born. No, we were never born. This body was born. Body and mind were born. We weren't born. Uh, nitya, uh, eternal. Shashvato yam, uh, lasting, for, lasting forever. 
Quran or the ancient one. Ancient because it existed even before the universe uh, came into existence. It existed prior to the universe itself. The hanyate hanyamane sharive. Uh, it's not killed even when the body is killed. So even when this uh, dies or is killed, uh, I am not killed. I last forever. As Swami Vivekananda says, turning the pages uh, of the book of life, I read page after page. Uh, scene after scene comes before me. Now in Swamiji's time, they had, uh, Edison had just uh, invented uh, the uh, uh, movie camera, but it was not, uh, uh, they weren't making movies yet. Uh, and so it, it, uh, Swamiji didn't have the facility of that or didn't have the advantage of that analogy, but that's a better analogy even than the book. So his analogy that we're turning the pages of the book of life uh, one after another, but uh, uh, an even more apt illustration we have now is that we're watching the movie of life. We're much, watching the movie of life, scene after scene appears, but we are the witness. Like when we're watching a movie in the cinema hall or in the comfort of our home, uh, we, see, uh, we see the movie, we see in the movie, we, as we forget ourselves and get involved in the action, we identify with the characters in the movie and the scenery and everything. We're going in the movie, we're flying to London and then uh, we uh, take a, a, a train and the ferry and another train to Paris. And we do all kinds of things. We get on a uh, roller coaster in the fair fairgrounds and do all sorts of things. But no, we haven't been anywhere. We're right uh, where we always were. It's just scene after scene in the movie that's appearing before us. And yet, if it's a good movie, we forget ourselves and we get so involved in the action that we actually feel that we're living in the midst of the uh, play. So um, uh, in uh, life, scene after scene is coming. And eventually, uh, this scene will pass from us when we die, but then other scenes will come. And so there's never a time when we won't exist. It's not that having come into existence, we will stop existing. So as the running translation has it, the self is not born and it does not die at any time. And it does not again come into existence by being born. It is birthless, constant, eternal, and ancient. It is not slain when the body is slain. So it does not come into existence again by being born. No, it was already uh, existing. Uh, and it's birthless, constant, eternal, and ancient. Not slain when the body is slain. So again, Sri Krishna is teaching this to Arjuna because he's on the battlefield. So this is the teaching that Arjuna was in the need of so that he could do his duty. And 21 uh, continues. Veda vinashinam nityam yayenam majam avyayam katham sa purusha partha kam khata yati hantikam. Veda avinashinam nityam yayenam majam avyayam. Uh, as often in Sanskrit, you have to start at the end to work back uh, in English. So, katham kasa purusha partha kam khata yati hantikam. How, O Partha, O Arjuna, uh, 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 can that self, can that being, that purusha, that self, kill or uh, 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 be killed? How can it be a kill or be killed? Uh, 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 that which is uh, avinashi, uh, that which is uh, indestructible, eternal, uh, unborn, and unchanging. When that self is uh, indestructible, eternal, uh, unborn, and unchanging, how can it uh, kill and how can it be killed? So the running translation says, Whom, O Partha, can that person who knows this self to be imperishable, constant, birthless, and immutable, slay or cause to be slain? And how? How can they, uh, uh, who can cause it to be, uh, uh, who can kill or uh, cause it to be killed, and how can they do it? When the, the person knows the self to be uh, imperishable, constant, birthless, immutable, etc. So again, the pe uh, uh, appealing to Arjuna's, uh, or teaching Arjuna the uh, nature of the self 
so that he will be able to carry forward his duties. Of course, the highest purpose of this knowledge is for the realization. But it helps us, as Swami Vivekananda said, this knowledge helps us in our everyday life. That's why Swami Vivekananda said, uh, the knowledge of the self, the knowledge of uh, Advaita, the knowledge of non-dualism uh, will help a uh, uh, will help the uh, 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 fisherman be a better fisherman, a lawyer be a better lawyer, a student to be a better student, etc. It will help us right here in our everyday life because it will give us the courage to face life. And it will give us the ability to face life knowing a higher standpoint, <clears throat> taking away the cause of fear, taking away the cause of anxiety. And so Swamiji saw that it had practical implications here. And he says in that same statement where he says, this knowledge of non-duality will help the fisherman be a better fisherman, the lawyer a better lawyer, etc. He goes on to say, and eventually it will help them to realize the highest truth. So he saw that it had even for ordinary people, even for the fisherman, even for the lawyer, uh, <clears throat> even for the student, it had practical significance here and now. And so that is what <clears throat> Sri Krishna is teaching also. <clears throat> the Sri Krishna of Brindaban uh, is the is Sri Ramakrishna or Sri Ramakrishna is the Krishna of Vrindavan, uh, who played his divine play. <clears throat> and Swami Vivekananda is the Krishna of Kurukshetra. You see that the, the same Sri Krishna was, uh, had the play in Vrindavan, and he also uh, was the teacher on the battlefield of uh, Kurukshetra. And so Sri Ramakrishna, he played his wonderful divine play uh like in uh, Brindavan and Swami Vivekananda was the one who came out onto the battlefield of life and taught us how to use that teaching of Sri Ramakrishna in our daily life and so uh, just as it would help Arjuna to face the battlefield so it should help us to face the problems of our daily life and uh, let me do at least one more verse, maybe another couple. <coughs> Excuse me. Verse 22 says, Vasam si jirnani atavihaya navani grihnati naroparani tata sharirani vihaya jirnan yanyani sanyati navani dehi. So Vasam si jirnani atavihaya just as we take uh, worn out clothes, uh, we uh, cast away worn out clothes, Navani Grihnati Naroparani, and the person takes, uh, takes up uh, other new clothes. So just as we cast off worn out clothes and take uh, new clothes to ourselves, Tatasharirani Vihaya Dirnan, so we cast off worn out bodies, Anyani Sanyati Navani Dehi, and take on new bodies. So this is the doctrine of rebirth. The idea that when this body is worn out, what happens in youth or middle age or old age, at some point the body uh, uh, stops functioning. It wears out uh, and uh, the body falls off. But then we take on a new body. Just as we take off worn out clothes and put on uh, fresh clothes. It's the same phenomenon. So uh, uh, just as a person gives up worn out clothes and puts on other new ones, even so does the embodied self give up decrepit bodies and enter other new ones. So again, just as we don't uh, weep when we have to change clothes, <clears throat> we realize that those clothes have worn out uh, or they're dirty and need to be cleaned whichever way. Uh, I need to take on uh, new clothes. I need to put on new clothes. That's just a natural phenomenon. There's nothing to weep about. So when this body wears out, uh, it's cast aside. And then another body comes. Not that that's the goal of life. The goal is to go beyond samsara, go beyond the very need to take birth. But as long as we need to take birth, as long as we need to work our way through the kurukshetra of uh, this world, we'll keep coming back 
and body after body until we finally solved the problem of life, until we finally realized God, come to God, and then we remain in a state of blessedness, a state of infinite bliss, infinite knowledge, infinite awareness uh, forever. Um, that is, we go outside of time itself and remain in a timeless uh, state of infinite wisdom, infinite joy, infinite fulfillment, which can never come to an end. There's nothing outside of it. Uh, so, uh, but until that time, uh, we don't have to worry that I'm not going to exist, that if I die, I'm going to disappear, though we don't disappear at all. This is, present life disappears, just as when we wake up from a dream and the dream disappears. So this, uh, this will all disappear and another vision will come in front of us. And that will go on uh, and another vision will come in front of us with another body. You see, it's a strange thing when you think about what is a world, a loka, a loka, the different lokas in the Hindu tradition. And this is one loka, bhu loka, uh, the earthly realm. You never experience a world without a body. Whether you're an insect, a tree, a dog, a cat, a cow, or a human being, it's through a body that you experience the world. Body and world come together. You can't have a world without a body. It's a strange thing, but uh, there's no possibility of an existence without someone to experience that existence. And so this, uh, this body and this world uh, are tied, tied together. And so when this uh, vision goes, because this body has disappeared, then another body tied to another world appears. And then we're in another loka. But we can't be in a loka without an appropriate body for that loka. So we find ourselves in another body in a different loka. And then perhaps we spend some time in another loka. And then we have to come back to bu loka, to come back to earth and reincarnate here. Or some people may reincarnate very quickly after passing away. But most, for most, there is an interim where we are in another loka, uh, in a subtle body for some time. And then suddenly we find ourselves taking birth again into this, in another world, in another body. But the body, we go from body to body, and the body is tied to the world. Without a body, there is no world. 